What if I told you that some of the highest paying tech jobs of the next decade are ones you've probably never heard of? I mean, forget the usual suspects like AI, development jobs, security. Today, we are going to dig into 10 lesser known but quickly growing tech skills that are shaping the future of work. I mean, each one pays well, has real demand, and might just be your next big opportunity. Let's dive into it. Okay, but before we get into the tech skills that could define the next decade, I want to quickly talk to you about something very simple, your keyboard. This is a Logitech MX Mechanical, and if you spend most of your day writing code, debugging, building prototypes, or just brainstorming, this is a kind of hardware that makes a big difference. Okay, so check this out. It's mechanical, so the keys have that precise, responsive feeling, but it's also low profile, so it doesn't wreck your wrists, which was a big thing for me when looking for a mechanical keyboard. Another thing I really like is the smart backlight only turns on when your hands are near. And yeah, it looks really good on a desk. So I've been using it for a while, and actually while I was working on this video, researching, writing, switching between tasks, that is the keyboard I'd use. It just helps me stay focused without getting in the way. But here's what I've really come to appreciate. The entire Logitech MX ecosystem. I mean, you have so many different options. If you like that tactile, mechanical feel, the MX Mechanical is great. But if you prefer a quieter, smoother typing experience, the MX Keys S Combo comes with a sleek keyboard and MX Master 3S mouse, a setup a lot of people swear by for deep focus and long hours. I mean, I have used the MX ecosystem for years. You've probably seen different versions of it on my desk or in all of my videos. So I can personally attest to how much I love it. I mean, I'm actually using it right now. Mechanical or not, the MX lineup is all about helping you stay in the flow and get through the day with fewer interruptions. I've included both links down below if you're curious. I've been switching between keyboards depending on what I'm working on. All right, let's get back into the tech skills that could define the next decade. Number one is one that I am super passionate about. I'm sure you've heard me talk about it, which is quantum computing. And I mean, quantum computing really flips the rules of traditional computing. Maybe that's why I like it so much. Instead of using bits that are either zero or one, it uses qubits, which can be both at once. It's like having a light switch that's able to be on and off at the same time, which is really wild. And this allows quantum computers to explore tons of possible solutions at the same time, making them incredibly powerful for certain problems. This matters in fields like drug discovery, AI, logistics optimization, I mean, the list goes on. Here's an example. Volkswagen used a quantum algorithm in Beijing to predict traffic flow in real time during rush hour. It processed millions of variables like weather, traffic lights, and driver behavior to recommend alternate routes. Now, a classical computer just couldn't scale like that. Now, there are so many roles within this space. I mean, if you want to do on the more technical side, of course, you'll need to understand more quantum programming, but there's still so many business opportunities within this space. Here are some tools that are very commonly used, especially within the quantum world. Second on the list is Geographic Information Systems, or GIS. GIS combines maps with data analytics. It helps us understand patterns based on location, whether that's tracking disease outbreaks, managing wildfire risks, or planning self-driving car routes. During COVID-19, John Hopkins built a global dashboard using GIS tech. It mapped live data on infections, recoveries, deaths from nearly every country. I mean, it became a daily tool for journalists, policymakers, and even regular people trying to understand what is going on. That is the power of this tech. Now to get started in learning about GIS, there are so many courses for Python for spatial analysis and how to work with spatial databases are things that are really important in this industry. There are some courses as well that you can take online. I mean, nowadays there are courses for everything you can take online, which is really great. So make sure to check out some of these courses as well to get started or even learn more if you are curious about these industries. Number three is creative technology. This is a real title, a real job. Creative technologists live at the intersection you can think of of art and code. They use tools like Unity, Unreal Engine, and Touch Designer to build immersive installations, interactive theater, AR, VR apps that don't just tell stories, but make you feel like you are inside of them. I mean, take the Museum of Future in Dubai. One exhibit simulates a space station orbiting Earth. Visitors walk through dynamic visuals and spatial sound systems that are triggered by their movements. I mean, it's storytelling you can physically walk through built entirely with creative tech tools. Now, in order to get into this role, you'll want to pick up Unity, Unreal, 
or some generative art techniques. It's more of a technical role, I would say. And frameworks like the ones listed here. And but the good thing is there are so many courses as well that you can learn about creative tech. And even if you're not a technical person, you can be more on the product management side of things, business side of things for this as well. Now, coming in at number four is one that was really hyped up for a while, but it's not going anywhere, which is prompt engineering. I mean, this is still one of the newest jobs in tech. Prompt engineers don't build AI, they guide it. Their job is to write inputs in ways that get exactly the right outputs from models like ChatGPT, Claude, Gemini, and it really is science, or there's a lot of technique to it. You're learning how the model thinks and how to communicate with it. Now, you might be familiar with a fintech company called Klarna. It's a really cool company, if you haven't heard about it, who now has full-time prompt engineers who design AI conversations. They've cut their average customer service time by 60% just by improving how the AI is prompted which is really wild. So they're seeing ROI on this role. You'll need a strong understanding of how language models works, plus pattern recognition and lots of experimentation. Now coming in at number five is Service Oriented Architecture or SOA. Modern software can't be one big app anymore. It has to be flexible, scalable, and easy to update. An SOA breaks apps into services, little independent components that do one thing well and talk to each other over APIs. This lets companies deploy updates without crashing the entire system. A really good example of this is Netflix. It runs this model. There are separate services for streaming, recommendations, billing, I mean, the list goes on. And if one breaks, the other keeps going. That's how they stay reliable for, I mean, at the time of this video, I think it's like 200 million plus users globally, probably more by the time it's released. To build this way, you need to learn API design, containerization with Docker, orchestration with Kubernetes, and service monitoring. Okay, coming in at number six is facilities tech integration. Now, this is really about turning buildings into smart, self-optimizing environments. We're talking about systems that regulate air quality, lighting, heating, and maintenance, all automatically based on real-time data. This is really cool. So Google's Bayview Campus is a perfect example that does exactly this. It uses sensors, ML models, and control systems to adjust energy based on who is in the building, the time of day, and even the weather. And by doing this, it's actually cut energy use by nearly 40%. To work in this space, you'll need to understand things such as IoT protocols, business management, building management systems, and ESG, or environmental social governance data reporting. Those are all really key, and you're making a really big impact on people's lives and how they operate in the office, which is a daily basis. Now, coming in at number seven might be a bit controversial still. I know some people hate this, but it's not going anywhere, which is low-code, no-code development. And this one really comes down to speed. I mean, low code platforms really let you build apps using drag and drop tools. You don't need to write full lines of code, but you can customize it with code. And this is ideal for people who know how apps work, but maybe you don't want to build from scratch every time. You wanna build with AI, you wanna to touch code sometimes, but not all the time. Domino's actually used low code tools to build a real-time inventory tracker for stores. And with a small team, they launched it in just weeks something they say that would have taken them months with traditional development, which is really cool when you start thinking about all the possibilities that low code can bring and the doors it can open up for people who maybe are just don't want to start everything from scratch with code. And now businesses are saying you don't need to. Coming in at number eight is digital twin technology. This is another one I'm really fascinated with. I mean, imagine a living, breathing simulation of a real world system updated in real time with live data. That's essentially a digital twin. You can have one for a building, a factory, a wind turbine, or even a human organ, which is really, really fascinating. You tweak the simulation, test different scenarios, and see how the real system might respond. Now, an example of this is Siemens built a digital twin of a manufacturing line. So before changing anything physically, they simulated different layouts. And by doing this, they reduced production downtime by 30%. No physical trial and error was needed. No money had to be spent. Well, not the amount that would have been spent anyways. Now to work in this space, you'll need 3D modeling, things like Blender experience, experience with IoT data streams and visualization patterns. Now I always say things you need to work in these industries or these fields, but there are so many 
roles within even this one I'm talking about, within all of them I'm speaking about that don't require technical skills, but more of that business side. So if it's still of interest to you and you're not a technical person, you can still go in these fields. Now coming in at number nine is edge computing. This is a really trendy term right now. Now edge computing essentially brings the cloud to the edge. So let me explain here. Instead of sending all your data to a distant data center, edge computing lets devices process data locally, which means it's faster and lower latency. I mean, take Tesla as an example. Its cars don't rely on the cloud to make decisions. That would be sick be very scary. It would take a while, even, you know, seconds instead of milliseconds. They process camera and sensor data right on the vehicle so they can brake, steer, or accelerate instantaneously without waiting for a server to respond. And you'll need to understand in this role for edge computing things like edge networks, embedded systems, and how to process data in real time. And there's tons of courses online that go through edge computing. And because it's so trendy right now, there's a lot of reading resources as well. Coming in at number 10 is ethical hacking. Yes, hacking can be a job and a legal one. Ethical hackers are security pros who find flaws before the criminals do. They test systems, find back doors, and report issues to prevent real damage. Apple, for example, offers up to, I think it's $1 million, it is $1 million, for critical bugs. One researcher found a lock screen flaw in iOS that let someone bypass all security protections and walked away with a five-figure payout, which is pretty cool. Now, to become an ethical hacker, you'll need to know things such as penetration testing tools, and study some security certifications as well, typically. This is a really cool job. It's basically like being a good hacker, but thinking like how the criminals do. It's kind of like a criminal mind. I don't know, it's a really cool job. And to understand how the tech really works and then reverse engineering it. I think it's gonna be a skill that's very in demand in the next five years, 10 years, especially as AI continues to take over so many different platforms and become so integrated in our daily lives. Okay, those are the top 10 skills that are going to be in demand for the next 10 years. And there are so many others we could list on this chart too, or this, this video as well too. But I picked those because I really wanted to focus on very specific ones, ones that you may have not heard of or may not be as familiar with that you can learn. Once you leave this video, take one or two of these that kind of sparked your interest. Start doing some research on them. Maybe take one of the courses that were popping up throughout this video and you can learn more about it that way. You don't need to necessarily commit to switching into a different field right away or industry right away, but just stay curious and know what is out there. All right, thank you for watching this video. Make sure to hit that subscribe button, leave in the comments what other topics you want me to cover, and I'll see you soon.